Did you see the COP28 conference? Tripling nuclear energy by 2050 in big, bold, black letters right across the stage there at COP28, the UN Climate Change Conference in the United Arab Emirates. Hello and welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and welcome back to this rock'em sock'em mining beat. You know, this news that comes out of this industry, it is fascinating. You could make a newspaper, and oh, by the way, it's called the Northern Miner. We do have a newspaper about all of this drama that is happening here, and there we are, tripling nuclear energy by 2050, with several world leaders on the stage in front of this big, bold, black headline. I mean, you can draw a conclusion that the global political elites have come to terms with the fact that nuclear is an essential part of the climate change discussion. I didn't see them put tripling solar and wind by 2050. We saw nuclear energy. And of course, a lot of people who listen to this program, many people think that way, right? I sure do, because I don't know what other solution we're going to do. But don't take it for granted. Look at Germany. They are still shutting them down. So this is something not to be taken for granted. And a significant, I would argue, from a purely optics perspective, a PR perspective, this is a big deal. You know, I always talk about resources being at the center of the discussion on, you know, frankly, global political power, what I guess we could call geopolitics, you know, but here it is. Literally, some would say this is probably the most important conference in the world. If your biggest concern is the health of the earth and carbon emissions, then this is probably the most important thing going on right now. And what's at the heart of it? In big, bold black letters, tripling nuclear energy by 2050. So a very significant development there. Now, not to downplay a new record in gold. We shot past 2100. It is retracing back down. It is at $2,036 last I checked. And I brought on Cam Curry, as promised, to discuss his strategy with playing this gold market right now. Where does he see the value, the senior, the juniors, the mid-tier? How does he plan to ladder out? How do you know when it's done, Cam? How do you know when to exit? So I ask him all the difficult questions, and Cam, of course, is a great speaker and a very insightful individual. So it is full of wisdom on how to tackle this gold bull market for all the investors out there. Does he like silver? What about copper? What about the industrial metals? Is gold leading the charge, as I like to say, the general at the front of the army with the other metals in tow? Or, you know, we have a story here that we're going to see. Fitch sees industrial metal prices falling in 2024, gold set to rise. That is the big question from my perspective on gold and the metals and where we're going. Will a global recession that some see is just around the corner, you know, David Rosenberg has argued very persuasively for that in the last week, that this recession is coming, some very, you know, intelligent people, Lacey Hunt, Gary Schilling, calling for a hard landing. So if we get a hard landing, maybe you don't want to be in copper, right? So all of a sudden, gold, what about silver? I asked Cam, his thoughts on silver, of course, having one foot in precious metals and one foot in industrial metals. Gold, silver, and uranium, one wonders, are those the recession-proof metals? Are those the safest bets? Very interesting discussion there. And finally, on the, I guess what we could loosely call the geopolitical front with what's happening in Burkina Faso, the reports I'm seeing from these citizen reporters on YouTube, they are reporting that Burkina Faso is banning the exports of raw gold. In other words, they are building a refinery in Burkina Faso. And I think I saw the leader of the military junta, Ibrahim Traore, putting down the first block of this gold refinery that they're going to build in Burkina Faso. So this is another story we've been following here for over a year. Fascinating developments where more and more countries in the global south, they don't want to just ship the raw metal. They want to refine it locally. We saw it in Indonesia that also want to process their metals. And here we have Burkina Faso. So it is gaining steam, this idea that these countries in the global south want their share of the pie. And we have to look at the other side of that pie, because what that means is less profits 
for the West. I mean, it's easy to look at one side of that story and say, wow, that's interesting. But that money is coming from somewhere. If it was being sent out to the West to be refined, well, all of a sudden that money is not going to be made as much anymore. That is the other side of this story, which is important to keep in mind, easy to forget as we read these endless news stories that come at us every day in this fascinating industry. So interesting developments there. So we have a ton of news stories to look at, as well as a CEO spotlight with Patrick Cruikshank of Nine Mile Metals coming right up. So a bonanza of information here for us to digest. Once again, on our weekly podcast, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to Patrick Cruikshank, CEO and Director of Nine Mile Metals for this week's CEO Spotlight. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome back Patrick Cruikshank, CEO and Director of Nine Mile Metals to the Northern Miner Podcast for this week's CEO Spotlight. Patrick, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me again, Adrian. It's great to have you. For those who aren't familiar with Nine Mile Metals, can you tell us just a little bit about the company and what you're working on at the Bathurst Mining Camp? Sure. We're a Canadian junior mining exploration company focused primarily on critical minerals. You and your viewers have heard a lot about EV evolution and critical minerals, sovereign protection throughout the world and so on. But we're focused solely on the Bathurst Mining Camp. It's the third largest mining camp in the world world famous uh, Brunswick number 12 mine, up to 335 million tons of ore. And there's 46 deposits already been discovered in the Bathurst mining camp, of which 25 of them are over 1 million tons. We primarily have four VMS projects, the Nine Mile Brook project, the California Lake Canoe Landing East and West, and the Wedge. So those are our four VMS projects, and we're focus primarily with those right now. We have two really, really big programs right now. One is on our Nine Mile Brook project. We have a lens and these deposits are in lenses and they are broken pieces of deposits. And we have the highest assay graded lens ever recorded in the Bathurst Mining Camp. And people can go to our website and see our press releases and so on. So we are focused right now on escalating that to a 25 to 3,500 ton bulk sample. And that's one program. At the same time, we've had our whole Western portfolio, which is the Wedge, Canoe Landing Lake, and California Lake, reprocessed with using leading edge algorithms and AI. And also, we're introduced uh, right now some new leading edge technology that uses uh, acoustic EM to get deeper. Because we believe, as does the government, that every 20 years there's a breakthrough in geophysical technology that leads to a rash of discoveries, whether it was gravity or VTAM or magnetics and so on, because there's only 1% outcrop in the Bathurst mining camp, 99% hidden, and they're vertical deposits. So very hard to find, very complex, and technology is going to unleash that. The problem is technology hasn't changed much since the 60s. It still only really sees down three, 400 meters, but a lot of these deposits are deeper. And we're testing this new technology with our drill program currently on a massive target. And you don't have to extrapolate the 3D imagery when you use sound waves and, and acoustic EM. It gives you native. So the biggest part we're testing right now is this company came to us and said they found the biggest target in the Bathurst Mining Camp on one of our projects and said it's it's massive. And they used the Brunswick 12 as a baseline for their technology and, you know, correlating all the elements and geotechnical items. And they've used that in their algorithms and so on. But uh, they've come back and we're drilling that right now. It wasn't our leading technology. We use three technologies, like I said, uh, late time conductive responses, looking for, we believe when you charge the ground, the ore holds the charge the longest when it's a solid VMS brick and dissipates the slowest. So when you have that technology and the EM technology reprocessed and this other one, when they all show us the same target independently, that's a priority target for us. So that's how we use our technical is not as a unified technical team. We keep them independent to keep them true to their own technology. And we integrate the three technologies overall. And that's how we use it for our roadmap and our exploration program. So we're very 
excited to be drilling our California Lake program right now. And we're, we're drilling a thousand meter hole, a really deep one. The Pierce points around 700 meters. And what we are testing is this company's ability to not only give us a 3D native full body subsurface, but the it's the density. No one's been able to use this density target. They use this technology in the oil industry and it's been very successful, but everybody's trying to find that elusive density target. So this technology we're testing, which also is justified by the other technologies as a target in their own right, it claims to be able to give us a density body. And you can see that in our in our press releases and on our website, people can go look at those subsurface modeling. But just think of it, I mean, the theory is besides all the other attributes the technology uses as a baseline, if it really can give us a subsurface density model, the ore body deposit is denser than the surrounding rock that hosts it. So that's simplifying it. I'm not a geologist, but that is the driving leading edge for this technology. But again, these other technologies have identified these 11 targets that we're going to test over the next year or two and trends. It's it's very exciting. We're, we're really interested in this right now. We are currently drilling it. So yeah, uh, last year we did drill, again, two of these targets were identified and we did drill them and we got eight DMS holes out of up to 20 meters. So we it has been successful. We did drill obviously nine mile and and hit some fantastic assays and, and we have a hard break on our lens. So we're really interested and, and the outlook is very, very rosy for us. And we, like I said, we have trends and, and 20 target trends, not 20 targets. 20 trends of VMS to go explore over the next two years. So you mentioned these lenses, as far as I understand, and yes. these VMS deposits. So what does that mean in terms of metal for people that are listening here and wondering, well, what does that mean? Like, what are you finding? Well, VMS is volcanic massive sulfides, and it is a deposit from a volcanic event back 400 million years ago when this camp was created geologically. And think of a volcano or event on a volcano spitting up mineralization, and then it settles and hardens and becomes a, a, an ore body. VMS deposits are copper, lead, zinc, silver, and gold, all in one deposit. For example, size and scale, the Brunswick number 12 was 335 million tons, mined for over 50 years, just closed down a couple years ago, not because they ran out of ore, but because these are vertical deposits, these lenses, from the twisting and uploading and, and, and folding and so on, they're vertical. It was about a thousand meter footprint on surface, but it goes down almost two miles. So it was unstable. It wasn't because of the ore. And, that, and that's the challenge. Mining this, you know, in the 50s, when you had engineering different than you would today, we obviously, it's very economic. These are monster deposits. If we can uncover a formula of exploration with technology, the government believes, as we do, that we've only found 30% of the deposits in the Bathurst mining camp. There are huge unexplored you know, we have 120 roughly square kilometers, and there's 3,800 square kilometers in the camp. 46 deposits, and we believe there's even bigger ones, but they're deeper. And like I said, there's only 1% outcrop. So the easy stuff's been found, Adrian. <laughs> okay, but for the investors, some of them who might just be saying, you know, I'm more into copper explorers, I'm more into gold exploration yeah. companies. Like, are you finding certain metals more than others, for instance? Like you mentioned quite a few metals that might be encompassed in a VMS deposit? Like, do you find like a, a more metals of one than the other? And it varies. Each ore body or deposit within the camp has a different formula, right? So our lens that we drilled in the Nine Mile Brook VMS program, that was on average about 12% copper, 38% lead and zinc, about 600 grams silver, and about three grams per ton gold. And that was over 20 meters. So think of it, you know, 12% copper over 20 meters is the same as, let's do it easier, 10% copper over 20 meters is the same as 1% copper over 200 meters. So that gives you the grade and how rich these deposits are and very economic because if it's in 20 meters of ore, you get all that versus 1% over a kilometer, you know, I mean, it's it's very, very lucrative and economic. These are very rich deposits, but another deposit right beside us, Canoe Landing Lake, is 33 million tons, 
and it has about roughly, don't quote me, but uh, it's around four or five percent lead zinc, but half a percent copper and about a gram of gold, over hmm. 33 million tons. That's very economic for a copper gold, but not economic for the lead zinc. So Mother Nature has a big part in this. You know, it is lucrative because you have five elements you get for free, but they all come together. So economically, I'll give you kind of a, a hurdle. Uh, About 10% lead zinc is yep. economic. Obviously, anything 0.25% copper and higher. And the same with, with gold. About 0.25 grams per ton and higher is economic. So if you look at those grades, we have insane numbers. The highest grade ever that matches no known deposit in the camp. So that source is still there, out there. Okay, yeah. so a very concentrated concentration of metals, in other words, as you're saying. So where's this going then? If, if there's an investor who says, well, this sounds pretty appealing to me, what do you have to say to them as far as where this is going, what they have to expect? Where are you going to take this thing? Well, like I said earlier, we have a bulk sample that we're going to launch as soon as we get the final permit, which is all all been filed. We're going to do a bulk sample and we'll get all the revenues from that. That was just the ore that I told you about. So very, very lucrative to the company probably more valuable than the market cap rate. So that's number one. Number two is we have a high technology, leading edge exploration program. We have VMS on two of our other projects to follow up on. We are just starting our exploration valuation, if you want to call it. So I think the timing is great. We are going to obviously be very active. We don't have any more geophysics to, to interpret. We are just going to go execute our plan now. Okay, excellent. Patrick Cruikshank, CEO and Director of Nine Mile Metals. Thank you for joining us on today's CEO Spotlight. Thanks for having me, Adrian. And thank you once again to Nine Mile Metals for sponsoring this week's episode of the Northern Miner Podcast. If you want to learn about Nine Mile Metals, simply go to ninemilemetals.com, turning to the website, and we have an update on the LME, which of course was at the heart of the nickel drama right as soon as the Ukraine war started and they lost control of the nickel price. We have an update on the court battle that ensued from investors that thought they were poorly treated and lost money because of what the LME did. After court victory, LME bids to reboot confidence. So the London Metal Exchange has won the court case, and this is Reuters via mining.com, as the London Metal Exchange savors its court victory over cancelled nickel trades. It still faces a host of challenges, including ongoing repair of its damaged nickel contract and reputation after being rocked by crisis last year. The LME on Wednesday won a legal battle with U.S. financial firms, which demanded $472 million in compensation after the exchange cancelled billions of dollars in nickel trades. When prices shot to records above $100,000 a metric ton in a few hours of chaotic trade. Having won the case, the world's oldest and largest market for industrial metals still has a road to travel as it bids to increase nickel volumes that plummeted after the crisis and is awaiting the outcome of a regulatory investigation. The 146 year old LME is contending with rivals such as the Shanghai Futures Exchange and the CME Group grabbing market share while also seeking to satisfy regulators and win back some disgruntled customers. And we have a quote from a senior executive at the LME, quote, the much bigger question is rebooting confidence, end quote, indeed. So interesting development and some resolution with the LME, interestingly, over there, at least on a legal basis. Continuing on, Western startups seek to break China's grip on rare earths Refining. This is Reuters via mining.com. And we have seen a few small attempts here. Let's see what the latest is. Startup tech firms are racing to transform the way rare earths are refined for the clean energy transition, a push aimed at turbocharging the West's expansion into the niche sector that underpins billions of electronic devices. So this is fascinating. Startup tech firms want to transform the way rare earths are refined. Let's continue here. The existing standard to refine these strategic metals known as solvent extraction is an expensive and dirty process that China has spent the last 30 years mastering. MP Materials, Linus Rare Earths, and other Western Rare Earths companies have struggled at times to deploy it due to technical complexities and pollution concerns. And scrolling down a bit, China began to rapidly expand in the industry starting during the 1980s and now controls 87% of global rare earths refining capacity according to the International Energy Agency. 
The prowess has helped propel the country's economy to the second largest in the world. Emerging Western rivals now offer the tantalizing prospect of processing the minerals in faster, cleaner, and cheaper ways if they can successfully launch. And we have a quote from Isabel Barton, a mining and geological engineering professor at the University of Arizona, quote, the existing rare earths refining process is a nightmare. That's why there are so many companies promising new methods, because we need new ones, end quote. Fascinating development. There, So they're actually trying to transform the whole refining process for rare earths. Continuing on, interviews with nearly two dozen industry consultants, academics, and executives show that if one or more of these novel processing technologies succeed, as hoped by 2025, they could slash reliance on Chinese rare earths technology and its toxic byproducts while also bolstering plans by Western firms to charge premium prices for the strategic minerals. While none have launched commercially, and some industry consultants and analysts question whether they will be able to do so, a cadre of firms are pushing forward with aggressive development plans. On a former U.S. Air Force base in Louisiana, UCOR Rare Metals aims to process rare earths by mid-2025 using a technology known as Rapid SX that it says is at least three times faster than solvent extraction, produces no hazardous chemical waste, and requires only a third of the physical space. And we have a quote from Michael Schreider, UCOR's chief operating officer, who said, quote, our goal is to reestablish a North American rare earth supply chain. And continuing on, so we've been following this saga with Cadelco, the main copper mining company in Chile, which is experiencing falling grade. They've had a replacement CEO. So we have another update here in this ongoing drama, this is Reuters via mining.com. Cadelco's production falls 5.7% in October. And a, just a couple of lines here. Cadelco saw production fall 5.7% year on year in October to 128,000 metric tons, the Chilean Copper Commission said on Tuesday. The world's largest miner of the metal has struggled with operational issues and high debt, with its production falling to a 25-year low last year. So just a small update there, but they continue to struggle with a year-on-year decline of 5.7% from the world's biggest copper miner. And on the copper beat, of course, we've also been following First Quantum and their challenges in Panama, facing a bit of a revolt there from a large amount of people that are coming out and protesting. We have an update here on First Quantum, Reuters via mining.com. Long-term sustainability, uncertain if Panama operations end, says First Quantum CEO. So more supply being taken off the market here. Let's take a closer look. The chief executive of Canadian miner First Quantum said he would have to look into how the company could sustain its finances in the long term, given Panama's push to annul operations at its local copper mine, the miner's biggest revenue source. And here's the quote from Tristan Pascal, who said in an interview with the Panamanian newspaper La Prensa, published on Friday, when asked about the risk of bankruptcy for the company if Panama operations end. Quote, we have strong finances in the short term and medium term, but yes, we have to see how we sustain them in the long term. And here is, to me, a huge issue here in coming to supply here. Uh, the company has notified buyers it will not be able to meet agreements Due to force majeure, Pascal added. So First Quantum is declaring force majeure on their deliveries of copper to their buyers. So that is quite fascinating here. And we have another story this time from Bloomberg on First Quantum. Panama mine shutdown threatens copper's surplus. So a few interesting developments here in the copper market. A plan to close a major mine in Panama, First Quantum's Cobre Panama mine, in other words, is threatening to upend the global copper market by whipsawing the industry back into a period of tighter supply. Until recently, the broad consensus among forecasters was that copper would enjoy a comfortable surplus for the next few years before tightening sharply later in the decade as supply struggles to keep up with surging demand for the energy transition. The expectation for a looser market in the near term has been reflected in copper prices, which drifted sideways most of the year. While inventory levels on the London Metal Exchange bounced back from perilously low levels to hit a two-year high last month, 
And we were tracking that very closely this summer, as many of you who are longtime listeners will remember. In early October, the International Copper Study Group said it expects a surplus of 467,000 tons next year, its largest forecast for a glut since 2014. Now the news that Panama intends to shut down one of the world's biggest and newest copper mines threatens to disrupt that trajectory. Copper prices have risen about 6% since the protests erupted in Panama and touched a 10-week high earlier on Wednesday before retreating. So more pressure really on assumed copper supply. And it's quite fascinating here. Bloomberg has a chart and they have the ICSG, the International Copper Study Group surplus projected for 2024. And it looks like it goes to about 450,000 tons. And then you see what Cobre Panama's production was in 2023. And it looks like just under 400,000 tons. So lower grades from Cadelco and a mine shutdown in Panama. Continuing on, gold ETF records strongest inflows in 20 months. This is Reuters via mining.com. Investors return to a popular exchange-traded fund tracking gold in November as prices of the yellow metal scaled a record high on growing hopes that the Federal Reserve will ease monetary policy in 2024. The $58 billion SPDR gold shares ETF posted net inflows of over a billion dollars in November, as gold prices rallied on expectations that the Federal Reserve could start cutting interest rates as early as March. And we have to see this, as Cam Curry points out, you know, in the context of the Magnificent Seven, you know, we have with Microsoft a $3 trillion company and only a billion dollars of inflows into the gold ETF is the strongest inflow in 20 months for perspective. So if we start getting a bigger inflow, it could get dramatic over there as well. And I was mentioning this in the introduction. Fitch sees industrial metal prices falling in 2024. Gold set to rise. This is Reuters via mining.com. Industrial metal prices should fall next year as lower global economic growth drags on demand. Notably in China, the world's largest consumer of raw materials, Fitch Rating said on Friday. Fitch said in a report that London's 2024 benchmark copper price could slip 2% to $8,600 per metric ton, while iron ore could decline by up to 8% to $111 per ton and zinc slide about 29% to $2,550 per ton. Interesting, because zinc has performed pretty well this year. Gold, it said, is a likely exception due to expected U.S. interest rate cuts next year, which could help spot prices rise 11% to $1,900 per ounce. And of course, from what I understand from our conversations with Jeffrey Christian, the reason why lower interest rates are positive for gold, because when we have high interest rates, ultimately getting a return on your money makes it less attractive to own gold. So as interest rates fall, gold could become more attractive. So that is interesting. And finally, a couple of headlines here. Global coal use at power plants to peak in 2023, Rysted says, and this is Bloomberg via mining.com, Global power production from coal will peak this year as surging deployment of renewables displace the dirtiest fossil fuel, according to research from Rystad Energy. Burning coal will produce about 10,373 terawatt hours of electricity worldwide in 2023 and then slip to 10,332 terawatt hours next year, according to a Monday report from Oslo-based research company. It's a small shift, but significant, as it says, a very small shift. Very interesting there and Saudi Arabia studies graphite rare earths trading platform, according to a minister, and this is Reuters via mining.com. Saudi Arabia is exploring the potential launch of a new commodity trading platform for battery materials, including graphite and rare earths, its vice minister of industry and mineral resources said. And here is the quote from Khalid bin Saleh al Mudafar, who told Reuters in an interview, quote, To be a minerals hub, you have to have it all. And we are studying a future minerals commodity exchange for graphite, rare earths, lithium, cobalt, and even nickel, as there is no efficient commodity exchange nor price finding mechanism for some. And then continuing on this pricing issue, he says, quote, we don't know yet if it would be feasible because the quantities are small and the specifications differ. It's not as easy as aluminum or crude oil. So very interesting development out of Saudi Arabia. 
And finally, judge orders Greenpeace off seabed mining ship and ocean standoff, Bloomberg via mining.com. So, of course, we've had the metals company on the show, and they continue to be at the forefront of the deep sea mining issue. And they were having issues with Greenpeace. And it says here, a Dutch court on Thursday ordered activists from Greenpeace International to leave a deep sea mining research ship that they have been occupying in the Pacific Ocean for the past week. I think it was Gerard Barron who we interviewed. However, the activists are allowed to continue protesting on the water around the vessel. The judge ruled. Fascinating. So so deep sea mining continues to get major pushback. Those are your news stories. Now, let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, let's take a quick look at the bond market. For context, the U.S. 10-year bond is yielding 4.18%. That is down 0.21% from last week. So big moves in the bond market there. The U.K. 10-year gilt is at 4.03%. So yields continue to fall down 0.18% in a week. Italy 10-year yielding below 4% at 3.994%. That is down 0.34% from last week, a third of a percent in a week. So bond yields really coming lower. Is this the sign of recession? A very interesting development there. Turning to precious metals, gold is trading at $2,036.30 per ounce. That is $17 higher than last week. Silver is trading at $24.51 per ounce. That is 19 cents lower than last week, despite all the drama of the last week in gold. Platinum is trading at $916.61 per ounce. That is down $2 from last week. And palladium is trading at $973.29 per ounce. That is $80 lower than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is six cents higher at $3.82 per pound. Iron ore is even at $130.46 per metric ton. Aluminum is two cents lower at 99 cents per pound. Lead is four cents lower at 95 cents per pound. Nickel is higher after several weeks of dropping at $7.64 per pound. That is 42 cents higher than last week. And tin is six cents lower at $10.77 per pound. Cobalt is unchanged at $15.16 per pound. Lithium continues to fall through the floor at $15.76 per kilogram. That is $1.90 lower than last week. Uranium is $0.75 higher at $81 per pound. And zinc is $0.04 lower at $1.11 per pound. Zooming out, it's tempting to see recession fears in these industrial metals as well as the bond market with, again, the main performer being gold. So that is quite interesting here as the rest of the metals edge lower. And those are your metal prices. Coming up, I'm very pleased to welcome Cam Curry, Senior Investment Advisor with Canaccord Genuity and leader of Curry Metals and Mining Group to the podcast. We discuss gold, gold stocks, silver, copper, recession, and everything in between. It is a fascinating discussion. And we also discuss the merger between Marathon Gold and Caliber Mining. Of course, Cam Curry is a shareholder there, but he has an insider perspective. So it is very interesting to hear how he sees that very interesting deal that happened a few weeks ago. It is a wonderful discussion. I hope you enjoy it, and I will see you on the other side. Joining us today, I am very pleased to welcome back to the show, Cam Curry, Senior Investment Advisor at Canaccord Genuity and Head of Curry Metals and Mining Group. Cam, welcome back to the show. Well, thanks for having me once again. Really appreciate it. Well, as we were mentioning before we started here, an absolute delight to be speaking of such a topical thing as gold on a day like today. I was seeing when I opened up my CNBC here, $2,062, big jump here today. Again, it's feeling bullish out there. 
So first of all, how are you doing and how are you feeling about this gold market? Well, very, very good about the gold price. Um, but I'm not going to lie, very frustrated that the uh, equities aren't playing suit in relative to the gold price. And, you know, again, I've given numerous uh, interviews in the past. And one of the things I've, uh, that I drive home in all my interviews is narrative. And narrative economics drives money flows. And right now we have gold at all time highs. Yesterday's close was the highest monthly close in history. And yet there's no recognition of that. And that's just the gold price, right? Yet the gold equities, the disconnect, has never been more extreme because nobody's paying attention. You know, everyone's back chasing the shiny objects of the cycle that uh, went to the bottom out last October. And they're chasing that back thinking, OK, if interest rates are going to come down because of slowing economy, then we're back on a growth curve and they're chasing those sectors once again. And yet the reality is, is that we're still seeing early signs of a, of a recession. And when bad news becomes bad news, that's when I think people will go, oh, wait a second here. That's why gold's going higher. That's why the dollar's going down. Maybe I should buy some gold stocks. So we're very, very, very bullish. The disconnect has never been more extreme. In fact, I had lunch last week with John Hathaway uh, down in the desert. And John's been in the business 50 years. Tocco Funds had us brought now. And one of the first things we talked about in that lunch was uh, we had, uh, the disconnect. And we've never seen gold equities this cheap relative to gold price in history. And yet no one's paying attention. It's a great point you mentioned. I mean, I didn't see that on the front page of CNBC, for example. I mean, I haven't been to the FT today, but I kind of doubt uh, that you know it's like gold at all time high. I don't know. I haven't looked, but it wasn't on the front of CNBC, to your point. So one of the things I wanted to ask you first, which maybe you've already answered in a certain way, is... You know, is it too late? Like if you're excited about gold stocks, it sounds like it's not too late from what you said. You're meeting with John Hathaway. You know, it brings up another issue, which maybe is maybe the more important one. Like how important is confirmation with gold stocks? I assume at a certain point you want them to confirm this move. Well, just they just have to validate the uh, proper valuations. I mean, gold's at 2060 right now. And if you're mining gold at eleven, twelve hundred dollars an ounce, all in standing costs, a hundred dollar move in a gold price is a hundred dollar increase in profitability right and so the valuations and the earnings of these stocks and these companies keeps on going up and so it's not about validation it's just about proper valuations and um i think i mentioned in, my, in the last interview and this is so 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 important i mean the gold is one of the top three reserve currencies in the world okay you have the us dollar euro and gold and this booming economy we have going in the United States is going to skirt a recession, which I don't see. They are running a $2 trillion deficit this year. Okay. Now think about that. You have a $33 trillion deficit. You've added $2 trillion at a year when you had record low unemployment, strong economy, and people aren't worried. And you got to refinance the debt moving forward. And so gold, I think, gold is going up more so from buying from outside the United States than within the United States. If you look at gold ETF holdings in the United States, they've gone from 3,400 tons to 2,600 tons here this year. So the Western world is still divesting themselves of gold, whereas the Eastern banks, Eastern investors, continue to buy it in lieu of US dollars. So again, that tells the real story. But in North America, where North, North American equity investors are playing, no one's paying attention to that shift. Indeed. I mean, we see it in, I was looking at the price of, say, Newmont and Barrick and, say, Newmont, the last bottom we had, it seemed like it was about $34, quite low, especially historically. And now I think is somewhere just above $40 on the New York Stock Exchange. And that's like a bellwether to a certain degree in my world, at least, or like, it seems to me like that's one of the favorites, it seems, of the, what I'd loosely call the hedge fund community in the U.S., when it wants exposure to gold. So can you comment at all on what you're seeing? And like, do you have a preference, say, for the, you know, larger cap over the mid cap? Like, give us a greater sense of how you're seeing the stocks right now. Okay, well, going back to Newmont and Barrick, for example, if you look at both those companies, they haven't delivered. They have no growth platform in their gold production. It's flat production for the next 10 years. They've had rising costs and uh, they, they disappoint the market because we've had inflationary pressures, higher energy prices. And so that's one reason why the stocks came off. But the only S&P 500 listed gold company is Newmont, right? And so using that as the bellwether for the sector, you know, they haven't really performed that well. Whereas I look at some of the other companies that I'm involved with, I could Endeavor, for example, you know, Endeavor's trading at 32 and change, almost near its highs. 
And Kinross is just breaking new highs here, but they aren't in the indexes, right? They aren't in the S&P. And, you know, again, one of the things that's so important to point out is that the entire gold equity industry globally, market cap is less than Home Depot. So it it has no meaningful weighting in in equity positions anymore. So gold is doing what it's doing, but gold equities haven't even gone on the radar. And one of the things I keep on pointing out to people is that we've had this declining gold ETF position in the United States. I'm constantly looking for that to shift. I mean, we had, you know, three weeks ago, we had 21 tons added. We had 10 tons added or 12 tons added last week. And yet two days ago, we had 10 tons sold. Yesterday, five tons sold. So we still don't have a shift in that direction yet. And it's when the gold ETF inflows start happening in the United States, then the gold equities ETF should start getting money inflows. And that will be when the money starts coming in because the investor of today uh, there's very, very few people like myself that are concentrated on on metals and mining. You know, most people are chasing ETFs and and U.S. equities and that. And our sector doesn't have an audience. Yeah, and it's fascinating. You mentioned you know the metals in general because kind of my sense here, and this is pretty intuitive from my perspective, admittedly, but there's a sense that the animal spirits, with this break above two thousand dollars. Again, as I like to say, it's kind of it's feeling comfortable above two thousand dollars now. Mm-hmm. And it feels to me like this is a harbinger of things to come, perhaps in the other metals. In a weird way, it feels like the general leading the charge here. And I mean, this is all very speculative, but I guess my question for you here, do you get that sense as well that gold may be leading the way for the other metals? I'm not sure yet. I mean, I think again, the u s dollar, I think it's going to continue to go down. And so that's very bullish for gold. The question is, is the U.S. going to have a recession, a soft landing, hard landing? That's still to be announced. I still think we have a recession coming and the extent of it, no one knows. But if we do have a harder recession, I think other commodities are going to suffer, right? And yet gold could be the be the beneficiary of that situation. So I, I don't know if they're aligned yet, but dollar going down is very, very favorable for all commodities, yes. But it's a question as to why the dollar is going to continue to go down. And, you know, one of the things that I think is really, really important, Adrian, to point out in the last month, there's been greater conversation about the treasury auctions and the poorly funded treasury auctions. Okay, and so people are starting to worry about, okay, U.S. debt. And the question here is who's going to keep on buying the treasuries? I think next year there's over seven trillion dollars of treasuries that have to be refunded. Well, we know China is no longer buying. they're, They're selling. Japan's been selling recently. So who are the buyers of the debt? And if the worry of refinancing this debt, which keeps on going up, and a deficit that keeps on going up ensues, then the rationalization as to why gold's going higher makes sense. And then people start thinking about adding that to their investments and therefore their equity investments. So I still think, believe it or not, I mean, how many other asset classes are trading at all-time highs in today's world? Yeah, other than Microsoft. Yeah, other than, NVIDIA. Right? Yeah. I mean, like, but other than the tech sector, you know, the, as you are mentioning before, we started here, the Magnificent Seven. That's kind of part of the reason I'm, I'm wondering this. I mean, with these other metals, because, I mean, we're looking at nickel here. Copper's still below $4, despite, you know, I'd say a pretty strong narrative until recently. But as you say, maybe that's more related to overall macro economic factors. So then just to clarify then, first of all, you focus on the equities, right? So your focus is on gold equities right now. You're not sussing out what's going on in other like copper equities. I'm very bullish copper long term and I've got some core positions on my copper side. I'm just looking at adding positions. I'm adding positions right now. My weighting is going towards precious metals for the reasons I've outlined. And I think, again, when gold's trading at all-time highs and no one's paying attention, when the narrative of why it's trading where it is becomes, and I I keep on saying, debt will become a four-letter word in 2024. And when it becomes a four-letter word, it'll get the narrative. And if U.S. dollar, which is the reserve currency of the world, continues to decline and people worry about U.S. debt deficits, and gold, which is the only reserve currency in the world that has no political attachment, no debt obligation, and no printing press, continues to go higher. I think that will be a vortex of money flowing into into gold, and therefore the gold equities. 
I mean, you know, every time in history where interest rates have rolled over and a recession's ensued, gold has started a new bull market. And it's hard to believe that we're at gold 2000 and no one's even talking about it. And we're seeing that scenario unfold. So, you know, you ask the question, is it too late? It hasn't even started yet. Right. Like in a sense, we might see this as maybe kind of a bullish contrarian indicator, because if it is on the front page of CNBC, then perhaps, you know, everybody's already bought in at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you know, and again, not investment advice, but from your perspective, this is not an overdone market by any stretch. Well, I just look at the psychology of this. Like I said, we talked about this so far in this interview. No one's talking about gold being at all time highs. No one's even talking about the gold equities. No one's even thinking about buying gold equities. In fact, we have a very big wealth manager here at Canaccord, and I was talking to him three weeks ago, and he was telling me he had a number of his clients who had some positions in some of the senior gold stocks, and they were selling them because they were so frustrated. Okay. Now, does that sound like a bullish market top? That doesn't sound like everybody no. is bought in. Let's no. put it that way, right? And you know, and again, I, I think I may mention, and maybe not in your interview, but you know, what happened in, in if you go back in history and look at 2000 with the dot com bubble, okay, the bubble pierced, it came down, and then after that, there was a 40% rally in the NASDAQ, okay? And everyone chased back the stocks they'd lost their money on, thinking they were going to make their money back. And I'm kind of paralleling what we're seeing in US equities right now in that. I'm not taking away from the NVIDIAs, Microsoft, Apples, those type of companies and that because they're delivered, right? And you know, AI is a, a real you know, narrative that's not going to go away. But my point being is that the money is chasing that again. And I remember in 2002, we were buying the gold equities. Gold was at 350, 370. And all the reasons, US dollar was starting to weaken, all the reasons for gold to go higher were there, yet nobody was paying attention. And the equities sat there and sat there and sat there. And all of a sudden, the dollar rolled over, and then the NASDAQ stocks rolled over, and then the gold equities took off, right? So one of the obvious things from my experience in history is that we aren't getting money flows into our space right now because people are chasing the stocks they lost all that money on and they think they can make their money back. So how do you play this then? Like, I mean, is this, you know, for the people at home who are trying to figure out how to play this, and again, this is not financial advice, but I, I wonder to myself, I mean, you're an expert. I mean, how do you play this? Uh, do you go with the large caps because they're supposedly safer? Do you go with the mid caps because maybe there's the most alpha there, shall we say? Or do you even go to the juniors, the most contrarian of all? Well, again, it depends on your risk profile. And again, all seniors aren't made alike. All mid tiers aren't made alike. All developers, all juniors, producers aren't made alike. You've got to be selective. As I mentioned, I mean, you know, you've got Newmont as a senior mining company, but then you've got other companies that I would recommend over Newmont because they've got better growth profiles and better financial positions, right? Mid-tier is the same thing. And then the developers, the, the challenge right now in, in the in the uh, junior junior part of the market is that there's just no money. And so being in those junior explorers right now that have to raise money to drill, I mean, we need a, a real shift in sentiment for those things to come off the ground. So I'm not touching those right now. I don't play a needle in a haystack. When I could buy companies, pay me a 4% dividend yield, training at 10 times P multiple, eight times P multiple debt free. Why would I go down the curve to the junior explorers that may not survive this if they, if they can't raise money? Right. And, you know, all that money that could come into the market, I mean, it's probably going to be, I would think, aimed like if you start getting hedge fund money, pension money going into the metals and the precious metals, it doesn't seem like they're going to start with the juniors. Like they're going to probably go no. with safer elements. And what about ETFs? I mean, how do you think of stuff like GDX or GDXJ? Uh, is that a viable solution uh, for people or what do you think? Well, that, first of all, ETFs, period are the new investment tool. You know, I, I look at all the wealth guys and, you know, basically they're just plug and play ETFs. Very few are stock pickers anymore, right? And again, ETFs are very powerful instruments. I've said this a number of times before, like look, look at the ETFs on cannabis and what they did to cannabis stocks. And most investors don't understand when they think buy an ETF, they just think they're buying like a, a basket of these companies or whatever, but they don't realize that those ETFs are sometimes not fundamentally intrinsic, okay? Once a company meets a certain market cap or criteria, it gets put into, into an ETF. And fundamentally, it may not deserve to. But when the money flows go into that ETF, they spray into the underlying stocks, right? 
And no better ca a case for Canadian investors to recognize was the stupidity of what happened in the cannabis space. I mean, Tilray went to $260 a share, now $2. You know, Aurora Cannabis went to 70 bucks, now 70 cents. And that was all ETF flows. Mm. And right now we have zero ETF flows into the gold equities. And so the thing about the gold equities that's so, so, so important to understand is there's so few companies out here. And so when the money flows do come into the ETFs and spray into the underlying basket of companies, you can't fabricate them like you could cannabis stocks where you take a wheat field and turn it into cannabis. I mean, these assets, you know, they take years. First of all, you got to find them. Then you got to advance them. They take years and years and years to get to the levels they are right now. And there's so few of them out there. So I fully expect when the ETF flows start coming in, that's when the real game starts. Because stock pickers don't exist in our space anymore. Primary ETF flows is what drives equities. And that's why narrative is so important here, Adrian, because narrative draws people into thinking they should buy ETFs and then they buy those things, right? Well, yeah, I mean, there's basically, I would say the general perception is it's like, well, it's kind of diversifying your risk, right? You know, that's the theory. Well, right? that's the theory, I mean, but the reality is that's absolutely the theory. But, you know, I look at ETFs and ETFs will buy the new Mons and Barracks and those type of companies. And again, I'm not poo-pooing them. I mean, in a bull market, they'll do well because for every $200 move in gold, it goes right to the bottom line. But to be selective and buy, in my view, the better performing companies that have better growth platforms going forward, they will outperform. In the last cycle, we were involved with eight takeovers. And if you look back on the performance of the big boys, they were up 30, 40%, whatever, once gold got under a certain price point. Well, during that time frame, you know, we we're up three, four, five hundred percent number of the takeovers because one thing about the mining industry, when people believe that gold price continues to go higher here, if you're a senior or an intermediate mining company, you have to acquire assets to replace your production. And you have to acquire assets to grow. And the value discrepancy between some of the mid tiers and seniors and some of the developers right now is extreme. And so there's some great value proposition in buying some of the developers and smaller producers that are growing. And again, you know, going back to your question, where do you, how do you approach this? Depends on your risk profile, but you, you have to have a, a, a basket that meets your, your financial risk. And, you know, that's what we do at Curry Metals and Mining Group. We put together portfolios for people to make, uh, match their profile. Okay, excellent. And on that point, I think the last couple of times we talked, we discussed caliber mining. And of course, they were in a big merger with Marathon Gold. And I thought it was an interesting kind of merger. I mean, they seemed like for lack of a better term, odd cousins, you might say. I mean, Caliber, I think, is based out of Nicaragua. Nicaragua, yes. And uh, there's Marathon, I think, out of Ontario. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting uh, merger. Now, you're involved, oh, as far as I understand, as an investor and in whatever disclosures you might need to make, or as far as you can say. But what is your insight on that deal? I mean, I thought it was an interesting deal. It kind of happened. And there were, I didn't see too many opinions on it from what I saw. What is your view on that as someone who's been paying very close attention and involved? Well, to answer your question, I'm, I'm a major shareholder in both because of the value proposition of both for different reasons. You know, I, I just want to clarify this because I know I was on a panel at our conference and we were talking about M&A. And John Goodman and myself made the comment we didn't want it to happen at this point because the developers were just too cheap, trading at 0.2 times NAF. And, you know, we don't want to see our assets being bought by mid-tiers and seniors and not getting real unlocked value. In the case of this, this is a very different situation. You know, Caliber, I mean, tier one management team. In Nicaragua, people can, you know, question the, the political risk there, but they've been operating there for a number of years. And they've taken... This company that had three years ago from what 80,000 ounce production, a debt position, to fast forward to today, 275,000 ounce producer with 100 million US in the bank, trading at a five times PE multiple, like unbelievable success. And so that's why we've become major shareholders in that. Marathon got caught in a bit of a juxtaposition because, you know, they got the permits for their mine in, in, uh, in Newfoundland. And a year ago, this past September, they, they made a decision to put it into production. Well, they did a big equity raise that pissed off a lot of major shareholders. And so the share structure of the deal got broken. And in that arena or that, that narrative, there was perception, you know, some people, you know, again, you know, there's also types of opinions about the asset, about the, the, the quality of the resource. And so this negativity and this broken share structure put them in a, uh, into a vortex. And they also had a, a funding gap of $40 million. They needed to get that funding gap resolved before they could tap into their debt facility. So 
the stock fell into this death spot and Caliber saw the opportunity. Here's Caliber with 110 million US in the bank, saw the opportunity of taking themselves from a 275,000 ounce producer, tacking on Marathon, which would be a 200,000 ounce producer, so you're a half million ounce producer and unlocking the value. So there's a situation here where it's not one plus one equals three, so one plus one equals five. And as I mentioned, that the manager team of, uh, of Marathon, both teams, I mean, they've done a very good job of, of building Marathon. The Caliber, which is going to be the, the manager team that takes forward uh, both assets, you know, uh, Darren Hall is just so first class and, and his team's first class. He built four of Newmont's biggest mines. Uh, Fosterville was a great success, which we all know about. And then he went in Nicaragua and unlocked the value there. And I'll, I'll back a management team like that any day. But here's a situation, and this is where this gets really interesting. The shareholders of Marathon don't really know the caliber assets and vice versa. So there's still this confusion of what's going on. But as people get more educated about the combination of these two assets, they're going to see a half million ounce producer, which is a mid-tier status. Now, the market cap of the companies right now is 800 million U.S., and if you look at mid-tiers comps, London Gold, Alamos, El Dorado, they're two and a half to four billion dollar market caps. This thing's eight hundred million dollars. So that's why I'm saying this is not a one plus one equals three. This is a one plus one equals five. So this new co, as you know, when the deal closes in January, as the market digests and understands where they're going with this, I mean, think about a half million ounce gold producer at two thousand dollar gold producing at eleven hundred dollar on standing costs. This thing has an eight hundred million US market cap. It's dirt cheap. This so that's that, why we're in favor of this, right? Yeah, and this is at $2,000 gold. If if gold stays at $2,000 and, of course, doesn't fall, but could could rise dramatically or somewhat, at least well, from here. Let me just touch that, too. Like just uh, sure. In the case of, let's just say Caliber, forget about the marathon asset right now, Caliber at $2,000 gold, this time next year, if they did nothing, they would have $200 million U.S. in the bank. Okay, so now put the two assets together, gold at 2000 I mean, look what this company is going to be two years from now. And you're paying $800 million for this company, U.S., producing half a million ounces. And again, this manager team, they want to grow this company. Fascinating. And are, are there any other companies that are on your radar as we start to wrap up here? Is there anything else we should be looking for on the sort of mid-tier front that you're excited about? Well, I'm excited about all of them because of the value proposition. But there's very, very, very few assets that are marching towards production or under construction and in a jurisdiction that's, you know, there's always challenging jurisdictions. But the one thing that's I want to drive home is the fact there's a scarcity of assets out here. And going back to when the ETF flows eventually come into the gold equity ETFs, you know, there's there's so few companies, and that's what's going to be the driving force. So when that money sprays into the ETFs, it sprays into the underlying stocks in that ETF, there's a finite amount of those companies. And I would argue that that's the real torque that's going to happen. And once we get price performance in the equities, then price performance becomes itself, and then people start chasing momentum. And we've had no momentum in, in it. If anything, it's been frustrating. And that's what, like I started off the conversation of this. You know, here's gold where it is, but it's very frustrating because you know nobody's paying attention to the equities. But when they start moving up by 10, 15, 20 percent, it becomes itself, and then people start chasing. Because I hate to say it, but humans are followers; they aren't leaders. And to be a lone soldier buying when no one else is paying attention, it's extremely difficult, but that's where the best rewards are. And that's what we're doing right now for our clients. Indeed. And it's like the narrative follows the price. Once the price starts moving, then that narrative will likely start picking up. As Absolutely. You, as you, uh, you know, point out, I, I love how you're uh, often uh, discussing narrative economics here, Cam. So as we wrap up here, then just, uh, just a couple more questions. So. In regard to silver, then, what is your sense of silver? I mean, silver has always kind of had one foot in each camp, the industrial side of things and on the precious metals side of things. How are you viewing silver? Do you see a similar opportunity there or is it perhaps more muddled because of perhaps macroeconomic risk? I love silver. And uh, <laughs> but the problem with silver, there's not that many silver companies, right? I mean, how many how many senior intermediates are there? There are very, very few. Silver as a as a as a mined metal in a lot of ways is a byproduct. And that's one reason I'm also very bullish on it, because there's some of the big CapEx projects aren't being built right now. And silver supply side is a serious problem moving forward. And so you know, silver is a, a poor man's gold in that respect. And gold's trading where it is right now, and silver has not followed suit. 
I think silver, once it starts getting its trajectory and you get the U.S. investors coming into the, you know, because there's a lot of very deep rooted silver bugs in the United States. And when the momentum gets going and silver price gets going, I think silver is going to torque. And like I said, there's very few companies out here and we've got very big positions in a select group of them. And uh, we're looking for significant gains. Okay, excellent. And a final question here. When do you sell? When are you going to know when to sell? Like, what is it sort of, you know, gold being on the front page of CNBC after everybody's been kind of freaking out about it and thinking it's going to go to the moon? Is that when you sell? Like, I mean, you're kind of pretty heavily sentiment based. How do you work that out? Yeah. Okay. So let's let's go back in um, in metals history here of the last few years. Look at lithium. Okay, where lithium was, the narrative was booming a, a couple of years ago, and the ETFs were were flowing into the stocks. And valuations just way overshot themselves, and that's when I sold oil. I didn't play the oil trade; I missed that. But look at where oil prices went. The narrative went to them, and copper. You know, we had the narrative build on copper, but then we had the Chinese resurgence or coming out of recovery, which hasn't happened yet. Copper stocks took off, so the narrative's been there. Two years ago, there was zero narrative towards uranium because uranium was a dirty word. Now it's a clean green word. And now Cameco has gone from 12 to $60. And so now the narrative's there and the money flows are coming in. So the answer to the question is, I fully expect we're going to get the narrative for as to why gold's going higher. And as I mentioned, I think debt will become a four-letter word. And as debt becomes a four-letter word, gold will take its rightful position. And when people are talking about gold and gold equities and ETF flows and that, the valuations will tell me when we should be exiting. But you have to also have to look at the fact that the narrative will tell you something too, because, you know, look at the cannabis, look where those stocks went. They far, far exceeded any potential valuation matrix you could look at. So who knows to say what's going to happen with the narrative towards gold, right? So you have to monitor those two. And, and again, it'll get to a point here where everyone's talking about gold and, you know, it's, and when everyone's talking about something, you know, you gotta be looking for exit strategies. And just a, a kind of an addendum, just a follow up on that. Do you ladder out of your positions or is that maybe that's private information, but yeah. do you ladder out of your positions? Well, again, depends on the clients too, right? And and again, you know, in bull markets, you always get the lead horses running first, then the mid uh, risk levels. Every bull market, you get the speculative stuff at the very end, right? And, you know, so by default, everyone will be drawn into the to the exploration stories at the end of this. And so, you know, we'll, we'll have to see because, I mean, you know, wherever gold price is and all of a sudden someone drills a magical drill hole on a new discovery in a project that's never been drilled before. I mean, there'll be some significant gains, but that arena is not the arena we're playing in right now because the narrative and the audience isn't there. And again, maybe I can just finish off, Adrian, by saying this, and this is so, so important. Canada is, is the mining capital of the world. OK, traditionally, over the years, we've had a very strong investment citizenship towards buying metal stocks and that. And the last few years, we've lost that. A lot of people have chased other sectors and that. They chased cannabis, digital. They went shopping in the U.S. equity markets and that. They chased oil and gas uraniums and that. But we just don't have an investor today that is actually really, you know, diving deep into this. And that's why, you know, we're we're marketing ourselves now to high net worth family offices because we say such incredible value propositions in the space. But because there's an absence of buyers, there's a great opportunity. And we fully expect that that narrative to shift. And uh, as it shifts, I mean, you know, that's our liquidity event for Exxon. You know, I know you're not a big Bitcoin proponent and, and I'll let you go with this. But yeah, I mean, I'm getting the same sense of needing to be in this market, <laughs> again, not financial advice, as I had when I uh, when it was Bitcoin $10,000. This is just something to get on. But we'll leave it at that. If I could just touch on one thing there, because that's a very sure, important please do. point. You know, Bitcoin was at 18,000. And, and one of the things that really ignited Bitcoin's movement upwards here was BlackRock's uh, Bitcoin ETF, going back to my ETF comment. And I remember it jumped $4,000 one day when, when they were getting some approvals for that. So fast forward, now we're at 38,000, right? And so the ETFs are driving force towards Bitcoin. And it's going up because people are seeing it go up. And the ETF flows are, are spraying into the Bitcoin. Well, here we are, gold 2080, all-time highs. No other asset class is at this, at this price point. There's zero, zero narrative, zero ETFs. So what happens when the ETF flows start coming in, right? And into the gold equities. And as I mentioned, the market cap, the entire global gold equities 
sector is less than Home Depot. Now just think about that. So when you get some money flows coming into the ETFs that spray into these underlying stocks, you tell me what the price performance is going to be. A question for us to ponder over this holiday season, Cam Curry, Canaccord Genuity Senior Investment Advisor and Head of Curry Metals and Mining Group. Thank you for joining us again today and sharing your insights. And I hope you have a happy holiday this holiday season. And we look forward to talking to you again in the new year. Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate that. Thank you once again to Cam Curry and Patrick Cruikshank for joining us on this week's episode of the Northern Miner Podcast. Big shout out and thanks to Nine Mile Metals, and you can find them at ninemilemetals.com for sponsoring this week's episode as we sail into the Christmas season here on our sleighs through the snow. An exciting time, an exciting year, an exciting industry. If you want to help out the podcast, please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Share it with your friends. And until next week, Take care.